Good morning, everybody. This is Lori Wilson with you on Community Voice. It is Wednesday already. Can you believe it? And by the way, uh, before I introduce our fantastic guest, one of my favorite Wednesday guests, as a matter of fact, don't roll your eyes, Wednesday guest. <laughs> we are on Facebook Live, so you can tune in uh, on WLBB's Facebook page and see us. That is me and Dr. Robert Schaefer of, I call him Bob, of University of West Georgia uh, Department of Political Science. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you again. It's so good to see you. You didn't know you were going to be on World Wide Web today, did you? No, not at all. So this is, this, once again, I'm caught off guard. But the eyes ahead. of the world are upon you. Oh, this is scary. So we're going to be talking today. All right, everybody, keep, get your blood pressure pills nearby. We're going to be talking about the question, not necessarily your position, but the question, I hate to say this, is the Constitution outdated? Yeah, that's the question. When you contacted me a month ago, say, Bob, you want to come visit? I'm thinking, well, what am I going to talk about? And then I looked down at my desk, and there was an article I had just printed off. It was an essay written in the week in January of this year. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's the topic. This essay uh, that you all can find on Google is by Ryan Cooper, and it got a lot of airplay, so to speak. Uh, and again, it was published in the week. But I just want to read two passages as an opening statement here, just to give you a sense of what's going on out there in America. This is his first paragraph, and I quote, The American Constitution is an outdated, mal mal malfunctioning piece of junk, oh my gosh. and it's only getting worse. Wait, wait, wait. Ryan Cooper's an actor? Uh, no. Um, well, no. He's an author. Uh, do Ryan Cooper the week. Okay. Yeah, here it is. All right. Uh, one more quote, just to get your blood pressure up. Um Throw the entire Constitution in the garbage, period. That's the opening statement. Now, why do I say this? Because more and more people uh, throughout the country are talking about the defects of the Constitution or that the Constitution is outdated or we have to revisit it, we have to do something. That's funny that it comes up right after Donald J. Trump gets elected. Yeah, that was, that was my impression because I read what he wrote here and then elsewhere, and I'm thinking, oh, he's actually responding to Trump, and he talks about... Uh, the two-party system, how bad it is and how entrenched they are and things don't get done. And yeah, it's anti-Trump in mm -hmm, spirit. But, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but either way, that's the beginning of today's conversation. Is the Constitution, which is 231 years old, outdated? And let me just... <laughs> Only a young person would say that, though. I mean, well, that's not true. I take that back. But, oh, it's 231 years old. Ergo, it must be out of date. Okay, really tell that to uh, tell that to to Plato or to Aristotle or Socrates, right? That, that this notion that oh, that so many years have gone by that it must be all BS now. Yep. Let me just add one more thing. I'll repeat myself. He said that the parties are too entrenched. He said that Congress doesn't get anything done, uh, and that the people who are voting for our elected politicians don't know what they're doing. No, that, that I would actually. Yeah. Oh, well, and that's where we're going to go down. We're going to talk about that. Um, can I just sound like a professor for 10 seconds? Yes. Okay, you, you start. Can, I'll give you 20. Go. Okay. Just want to point out, and I, I like to tell this to my students because it's good to know, but when George Washington was asked, how long do you think the Constitution will last? This is in 1788 or 1789. He said about 20 years. Because okay. it's generational, we forget, future generations forget. So I have to admit, I'm, I'm now praising the Constitution because it's lasted that long. What, when was the very first, after, after the Bill of Rights, uh, what was the First Amendment after that? Uh, um, it would be the 11th Amendment, and I have everything right here. Okay, but, good. Uh, hey, yeah, and you can show everybody on the camera that you're actually... But the year is, oh, here you go, yeah, but the year is 1795, and I won't get into it now, but the bottom line is the, oh, you're going to love this. The federal government was trying to exercise its new powers, and this great state called Georgia got ornery and upset and said, no, we're going to put you back in your place. And so it's an interesting court case having to do with some someone who owed or it was owed money by the state of Georgia. It was a minor issue, but it blew up, went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court sided with the guy who was owed, mo owed money. And then the state said, you can't get involved in our state business. So it was the First Amendment. Okay. So um, Amendment 11. 11, the First Amendment after the Bill of Rights, yeah. Correct, okay. correct. Okay. So. Interesting. But, oh, let me add one more thing, All and right. I'm going to read one more piece. Um, and I, again, I know I sound like a school teacher. Well, you are. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Washington thought we'd last about 20 years, and of course it's remarkable that we've lasted this long. 
and I say this because when we have the conversation, is the Constitution outdated, it's kind of understandable because everything has changed. Uh, you know, the post-industrial revolution, mm -hmm. the globalized economy and all that good stuff. But the other thing I want to say is the Constitution has re rarely been changed in 231 years. What is it, 27 amendments we have now? 27. And that's after, that's actually only 17. Correct. And then the uh, Amendment 11 have, having to do with state sovereign immunity, three Civil War amendments, which are really important, but then two amendments regarding liquor, they've come and gone. So okay. my point is 17 amendments have suddenly shrunk to 15 and 14. I mean, there's about four or five amendments pertaining to the office of the presidency. Uh, for example, we did not, we, the American people, did not decide until about 1967 uh, who would replace the president if the president died. Was it that recently? Yes. It was always assumed the vice president, but it wasn't was in it? writing. I see. And my point here is that's really technical, and we, we the people, clarified it. But we haven't really changed the Constitution in a fundamental way. So when that person asked George Washington way back when how long he thought the Constitution would last, and he said about, what did you say? About 20 years, about a 20 generation. Years, was He wasn't being flip. Oh, no, no. Because this whole business of constitutionalism, and that's why I'm here, was really an experiment. And they kept using that phrase always, that word. It was an experiment. Can this actually work? Because, and here's the key, I'm looking at the camera, uh, constitutionalism, which has a 2,000-year-old history, sure. was, was always very tenuous, particularly republicanism. They just didn't last. And it was so new, too. I mean, it, it was an offspring of divine right monarchy, right? And uh, it what differentiated it? I just took myself on a detour. <laughs> because it, it, my brain, two, two thoughts collided. One was 17... Is it 89 it was ratified? Yeah. 1789. It went, went into effect in 89, Okay. Yes. Hey, go me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just so surprised I remember that. And then 1780, it was also 1789 at the, the French Revolution started, right? Yeah. The 14 juillet. And that was a total radical uh, democracy. That was not a representative republic. And it went very, very badly. You bet it did. Um, is there some correlation there or something you could say about the how remarkable the American one uh, revolution was as compared to the disastrous French? Yeah, I'll do this. I'll try to do it in 20 seconds or less because a lot of thoughtful people from here or throughout the United States and Europe for years have thought about this. But the bottom line is the United States is exceptional. Let's start with that. It is exceptional. But we also were far away, meaning when we were experimenting with republicanism, we were thousands of miles away from Europe. And that mm -hmm. protected us. That's helpful. But we also had many, many, many decades of of experience with self-government. I mean, mm -hmm. before the Constitution was written, we had all the colonies that were constantly experimenting uh, with self-government, and a lot of the experiments failed, and then they tried it again, I meaning Rhode Island and Massachusetts. So the people who met in the Philadelphia Convention actually had many, many, many years of experience mm -hmm. of writing constitutions. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also one other thing. I just want to throw this out because I was reminded of this about a year ago. The great Alexis de Tocqueville, the yeah. French French writer, when he came to America, of course, he spent nine months here, goes home, and I love this story, this part of the story, he spent about 10 years writing a book, goes home, greets his wife, and then sits in his study for about 10 years, writing this really thoughtful book that everyone should get a copy right, of. Right, it's just a seminal work. That, uh, funny that a French person yep. who was, it was before the French Revolution, was it, or after that he uh, wrote? Af after, after, obviously. After, but he was also a very much a friend of republicanism. Yeah. But, Especially having lived through the revolution in his country, I'm sure. But what one of the things he says is he talks about the American Constitution and the founding, so he sounds like a school teacher. Mm -hmm. But he says, and this is really interesting, I'll let your audience sort this out, he says that the true American founders are the Puritans. <laughs> oh, okay. Because they are the ones that you know, fled Europe, of course, um, and for religious reasons had to leave, but also learned to... Uh, uh, rule themselves mm -hmm. and it wasn't easy he talks about how sometimes their decisions and their way of life was my word a little nutty yeah I mean, but they, they set started the stage. In sort of a communistic kind of way yes. and they found out that human nature being what it is yep. didn't work yep yeah yep so but there's a lot can, that can be said about why the american constitution worked and part of it is circumstance chance a lot of land resources 
when we talked about going out west in 1788, that meant Ohio. Oh, yeah, exactly. That was the Midwest back then. Yeah, right? and, but that's helpful if you have the land. Um, yeah. All right, but I have one more quote when you're ready. But... Okay, and then we'll go to our next break after. Okay, everyone, here comes the quote that inaugurates the first break. Go. All right, I just read Ryan Cooper's quote, as you all heard, yeah. and he's so-called from the left. But the same conversation is occurring on the right, and that's mm -hmm. why I wanted to be here. This is not just some people in West Texas in a cave talking about getting rid of the Constitution. Two years ago, a fellow named Jason Brennan published a book called Against Democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason Brennan teaches at Georgetown, mm -hmm. and you can do a Google search. But essentially what he says is the American Constitution or the government is flawed. The voters don't know what they're doing. The parties are too entrenched and we need to change everything, and he's promoting, I'll just say this, and we'll come back after okay. the break, something called an epistocracy. Epistocracy. All right, okay, so we'll look that word up uh, in the next 60 seconds while we hear from <laughs> Tanner Hill System. Uh, we'll be back uh, very soon, uh, so stay with us, everybody. At Tanner, we're advancing health throughout West Georgia and East Alabama, because we know that exceptional care isn't based on how many patients we serve, but how well we serve them. That's why we're focused on quality, delivering the best possible care for our patients. It's why we're expanding our clinical services and building new facilities to serve our growing community. And it's why we're looking beyond our hospitals and medical practices to develop sustainable wellness and preventive health programs in our region. What makes a hospital great has changed. It's not how many beds we have, it's how well we care for the neighbors who need them. Delivering the right care to every patient, every time, is how Tanner is advancing health with medicine beyond measure. Learn more at Tanner.org or find a physician on our medical staff by calling 770-214-CARE. Let's jump right back into today's amazing conversation with Dr. Robert Schaefer, whom I get to call Bob. Good morning. Good morning again. Uh, political Science, uh, University of West Georgia, and Ombudsman there, too. So you've got two, two full-time jobs. Yes, I did. <laughs> we're talking about the Constitution uh, and whether or not it's outdated. Uh, okay, epistocracy was a term you busted out on us. And I just learned this term recently. Again, it comes from Jason Brennan, and, and he is... A, a libertarian okay. so he's not from the left he's from the other side of the spectrum but essentially what he says is and I mentioned this a moment ago uh, the parties are entrenched they don't really do anything effective but more importantly this is his argument not mine the voters don't know what they're doing they don't know anything about government they just pull the, the lever uh, because they're a Democrat or a Republican and what Brennan is arguing is that are you ready we no. should have a test no one is allowed to vote unless they pass a test. Just a basic civics test? Basic civics test. You know, you're reminding me, first of all, there's a couple of things. I was, just yesterday, I was talking to my, uh, I don't know, one of my classes, and we had read uh, some sort of article that talked about the perils of having politics and popular culture television mostly mm -hmm. uh, in such a marriage you know like what what are the entailments of having media be be sort of the conduit by which we understand or think we understand what's going on in in a political race it reminds me of what you're saying because tv as i think we all know can be very manipulative the quote unquote news can oh, yeah. be very manipulative. Yep. So tell me more about this test because I'm not altogether opposed in, until I find out exactly what would be in the test. Yeah, I'll tell you as much as I know, I'm still learning about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and the book just came out just two years ago and, and it too got a lot of airplay. A lot of people are responding to it. But essentially what he wants to do is get a bunch of citizens, just random citizens, get them together give them time off from work, pay them, and have them come up with all sorts of very specific questions. And one question that I remembered he mentioned was, uh, what percentage of the federal budget is used for defense? And you have to be able to answer that question and other questions before you get the right to vote. If you don't pass the test, you lose the right to vote. Oh, my God. I can just hear all of the people on the left screeching their heads off. Right. Well, okay. But <laughs> let, me, let me just clarify one thing. Epistocracy is a fancy word, but it means knowledge. 
epistemology. Epistemology, yeah. Um, but he's also doing other things that I can't get into now. What is he essentially, essentially saying is, is that the the voters not only have to be more aware of uh, government, but they have to be more aware of each other. That's what his real goal is. And so what he suggests in one of his writings is that votes, you're going to love this, right. will be weighted. Okay, now it's too mathematically upsetting yeah. to me. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, it means the statisticians will essentially say, okay, you passed the test, Lori, uh, but what is your? Uh, what are the demographics? Oh, you're a white male. Well, white males are notorious for being self-interested and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, you lost me. Well, he lost me. Well, I'm not, okay. But he's just throwing this up because what he's, well, okay, I'm not defending him. But, I know you're not. But what's interesting, and I just discovered this yesterday, in preparation for today is, yeah, white males are notoriously self-centered and privileged. How can you say that's so sexist? You're a sexist against your own sex. Are you pointing to me or Jason? Everybody. Okay. But no, the, yeah, Jason, you're right. What he's, what's interesting, though, is he then t talks about how black male votes should be weighted a little bit heavier, but not as heavy as female black votes. They get more weight because they are more culturally sensitive. Okay, I'll tell you what. No. <laughs> I'm just telling you. He lost you. me. He totally lost me. Okay. You know, making it about, uh, making it about race and gender is absolutely it's it's terrible and that's what's wrong here's on the here are the bases on which i would maybe support or at least stay at the table in a conversation about an epistocracy that okay and that would be we do have a failure of public public education correct all right a hugely failure that's that's big government just ruining our kids in in lots of ways in the schools uh we have too many uninformed uh, people who can pull the lever also, we have too many government dependents. So what is it? It's over 50% of some demographic, I can't even remember, are getting a paycheck from the government. Does that include Social Security? I'm curious. Uh, no, 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 I don't think so. But am I, no, I, that's a good point. But this is what happens when I try to, to uh, turn a generalization into a statistic. But we have too many government dependents. Okay. Okay, so... so um, I agree that we need to be more well informed, but this whole idea about the weighting of the, 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 I know you're not a proponent of this. But, and it's also, he's just floating this, it's clear that he's, as a writer, he's just floating ideas just to get a reaction. Um, and that's important. I'm trying to defend him because he's right when he says that a lot of us don't know what we're doing. Uh, and a lot of us just don't vote. That's the other problem. Meaning who actually votes? Those who are really entrenched in their opinions. The everyday person, a lot of people just don't vote turnout is low here's, he's, he's right here's something that i would like you to just comment about i think we might have talked about this before but there is uh, an actual movement in the united states and it's gaining traction it's called uh the article 5 convention uh, convention of the states uh, and this is an article 5 of the constitution so it wasn't even an amendment uh the article tell everybody about the two ways in which uh the founders or the framers of the constitution are gave us to change the Constitution. Okay, I'll do that. If I may, though, I'll just add one more thing. Mm, okay. I gave an example from the so-called left and an example from the libertarian, but I do want your listeners to, if, when they get a chance, go online and look up something called ALEC, A-L-E-C, okay. and that stands for American Legislative Exchange Council, and it's a really interesting organization that has a lot of influence in at least 22 states in the union, meaning they work directly with state legislators. And essentially what they're doing, among other things, is arguing that we need to have a constitutional convention. Okay. And start over. Start over, but we need to we need to have option two and not option one from Article five. That Okay. Okay. So you want to talk about that real quick and then yeah. we'll go to another break? So Article five, what what you were referring to, Lori, is Article Five of the Constitution and, and it's a really short article. In mm -hmm. fact I have it before me. Yay. But it's simply uh, uh, clarifies how the Constitution can be amended. And We've only done that through the first option, and we want to try. I want to try the second option. What do you think? Well, the first option is where the House and the Senate get together and say we need to think about an amendment uh, or whatever. Mm -hmm. This and the second amendment is um, or the sec, excuse me. The second way is where uh, the states actually call for a convention. That's right. That's right. So that the states can call the, the can vote to have a meeting of two-thirds of the state legislatures so that we get the decision-making out of Congress where we have career con con 
uh, senates, senators and legislators who go in making about 30 grand a, month, a, a year and then they end up being millionaires. So I don't know yeah. what happened. And their lifetime, the framers never wanted us to have lifetime. Right. You're right. And that's where a lot of people on the right, including this organization called ALEC, and a lot of some people on the left kind of agree. Uh, they do. They're saying we've got career politicians, but your turn. And they're messing. Around. Okay. Well, I will take my turn by saying that it's time for our second break, and we're going to hear from Tanner Hill System, uh, packing three hours worth of conversation into the next ten minutes when we get back. So stick around, everyone. We'll be back in sixty seconds. At Tanner, we're advancing health throughout West Georgia and East Alabama, because we know that exceptional care isn't based on how many patients we serve, but how well we serve them. That's why we're focused on quality delivering the best possible care for our patients. It's why we're expanding our clinical services and building new facilities to serve our growing community. And it's why we're looking beyond our hospitals and medical practices to develop sustainable wellness and preventive health programs in our region. What makes a hospital great has changed. It's not how many beds we have. It's how well we care for the neighbors who need them. Delivering the right care to every patient every time is how Tanner is advancing health with medicine beyond measure. Learn more at Tanner.org or find a physician on our medical staff by calling 770-214-CARE. We're going to jump right back in. Good morning, everybody. Final segment of today's Community Voice. Every time you, Dr. Robert Schaefer, by the way, uh, University of West Georgia, uh, and an ombudsman as well, uh, political science professor, every time you show up, you just open up a Pandora's box, and then you go, oh, we're out of time. Bye. And the rest of us are going, wah. And you're, you've done the same thing today. Now, you're not proposing you're not a proponent of any of the uh, methods or even reasons why to uh, uh, to amend the Constitution, but we've uh, you're just sort of telling us that it's out there. And yeah, none of us are really thrilled with the way our government is operating right now. So let's talk more about this Constitution, uh, this Article Five Convention of States. Okay. And yes, I'm not proposing any opinions at the moment, but other than I agree with a lot of the people on the left and the right that uh, the national government, Washington, is big, entrenched, doesn't get much done. Mm -hmm. The party system is really kind of broken, and I can suggest a lot of people to come sit here and talk about that. Um, how we fix things is another story. In fact, we'll have to have this conversation later. Okay. But here's the, how is the, how might the the Constitution be amended? And the simple answer is two-thirds of Congress can start the process. Should we have a 28th Amendment? Or two-thirds of the state legislatures can start the conversation. I mean, if two-thirds of the states say, let's have a conversation, then the states will all have conventions. But here's the important thing. How is an amendment added to the Constitution? Only if three-quarters of the states approve it. That's right. So, so people who are against this idea of the, taking the section option to uh, taking this decision out of primarily the, the career politicians in in Washington and just letting the states confer, it's still very very difficult. Right, and I did the math, used a calculator. Did you? But Thirty-eight states are required. Yeah. Think about it. Thirty-eight, 38 states, states have to agree on an amendment, which is why, and I'm, I learned this from my colleague Tom, Dr. Tom Hunter. 12,000 amendments have been proposed over the last 200 years. 12,000. Wowie, wow. And we've we only have... actually amended it 17, excluding the Bill of Rights. I'd like to just read a, a, a sure. modest list of one of my one of my very favorite political gurus. His name is Mark Levin, and actually we, we carry, or we I think we have his show at night uh, on this station. He proposes a constitution. Uh, a convention of the states because Washington is so broken. And I'll just read a few of these. Impose congressional term limits. Thumbs up or thumbs down, you think? You don't want to... Uh, well, no, I, I've struggled with that a few years ago. I'm not, I'm not pro, pro term limits. You're not. Okay. No. All right. Okay, that's oh, next week's conversation. I was just thinking about Ted Kennedy. I was going to say something. Okay, repeal the 17th Amendment, returning yes. the election. Yes, get okay. rid of it. But what is... Uh, that's the 17th Amendment allows for... It means that the senators are... are um, Going, will go back to being answerable to state legislatures. Right. And that's really important to a point, my last point that I want to make when you're done. Okay. Uh, impose term limits for Supreme Court justices and restrict ju re judicial review. We cannot restrict re judicial review. Uh, we just cannot because that's the very nature of the court. Okay. Um, now, that, that's, that's, there's a difference, let me interrupt, between judicial review and judicial activism. 
Okay. And so he's probably referring to activism, but I'm guessing. He may be. Okay, require a balanced budget and limit federal spending and taxation. Uh, I would... I would want to achieve that goal, but through different means. Make uh, Washington more responsible. We well, can talk I mean, about how long have, Okay. I know how to do that, kind of. All right, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, define, I'll just skip to a couple more. <laughs> Limit eminent domain powers. Yes. Uh, allow states to more easily amend the Constitution by bypassing Congress. Um, that's a tougher one. I'm going to pass on that. Well, it's predicated on the inevitability that sooner or later yeah. a, a lot of congressional uh, members of Congress are going to get totally corrupted. Here's one thing I can assert, and I've come to this conclusion the last six months. I think we're going to, uh, we, the American people, are going to talk seriously about a convention or amending the Constitution. Ten years ago, I would not have said that. Mm -hmm. I said no. Today, uh, it's possible. Yeah. That's where we are today. Okay. But go ahead. The only one, the, the, the last one I wanted to say is to require photo ID to vote and limit early voter. Uh, uh, the photo ID, ID, I think that's fine, just to prevent any type of fraud all across the spectrum. Yeah, okay. Um, but with, with that said, may I make one more comment? Please. Here's the problem. Here's why uh, Jason Brennan and, and all these other folks are talking about this stuff. The national government, no matter how much we praise it, was never meant to be uh, this big and this active. And That's I'm right. not trying to sound like a libertarian, but when the founders put it together, they not assumed... Not that there's anything bad. I won't argue that. that. But they assumed that there would be, at a well, today, 51 republics. Washington, and I'm quoting uh, McCulloch v. Maryland, Justice mm -hmm. Marshall, Washington is supreme, but limited. Meaning the federal government isn't made, wasn't made to uh, regulate the details of everyday life. And, and that's the problem. And and what Woodrow Wilson wanted to do, I'm just throwing this out, was say, okay, fine, we'll give over legislative powers to the bureaucracy. That'll solve the problem. No, well, no, he was one of the worst presidents we ever I, had. I won't dispute that, but but the government isn't made to take care of all the details, and I've got my little list. Health, Social Security, Education, Environment, <gasps> Housing. <laughs> I mean, it's difficult to do all of that a, a thousand miles away. And, and I, I'm, I'll just assert this, even though they're not here. Every single founder would agree. I agree. Um, but, because but, the, because what we have in essence is a rule by un, unelected. We are subject to unelected uh, bureaucracies and bureaucrats, and so we we have no say right, right. in in some of these in a lot of these uh, statutes or or regulations. regulations that we don't even know that we're in in violation of. Yep. And that sounds a lot like divine right in a way. Well, sort of. but We have but, two minutes left or years. Well, I just want to clarify that when the founders put all this together, and yeah, they were dealing with very specific practical issues, what they said was states are still sovereign. States, the state of Georgia is a sovereign republic. Mm -hmm. But it's going to work with Alabama and New York, but also with Washington. Um, but the bottom line is the Constitution is such that you cannot have the current government the way it is today. What's our takeaway in the one minute that we have left? Uh, should we rethink the party system, which my colleague Chapman Rackaway talks about? Mm -hmm. Perhaps. I mean, the two parties are entrenched. Mm -hmm. Should we think about increasing the House of Representatives? And I'm actually willing to talk about that. Today we have 435 representatives, but each representative uh, represents about 800,000 people. No, they don't. They cannot do that. Right. 200 years ago, each representative represented about 30,000 people. Okay, that's more manageable. So should we increase the House to like twelve or 1,300 members? And that is something we have to talk about, all of us. Well, the, the lobbyists, and, and they're going to have to really up their game, aren't they, <laughs> to get more of those guys in their pockets? Yeah. And, and but those people, if we, if we get more representatives, and I'm still thinking it through, they might actually um, be more responsible to us here in Carrollton mm -hmm. or in South Georgia or in western New York. It's Okay, uh one minute left. Okay. What do we do about all of this? What do you want us to be doing? Uh, the simple answer is give thought to the people that I've been referring to, and I'm going to keep reading too. Okay. Because yeah, more and more of these, uh, uh, more and more people are writing about the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But give thought, and this is not easy, on the nature of the Constitution. I'm arguing, echoing the founders, yeah, the national Constitution was, was meant to be supreme but limited. Um, mm -hmm. But the government life is different today. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Think about it. Um, should we have an amendment? Pro should we have a convention? Perhaps. Okay. Perhaps. 
I'm going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being with us, Bob. Thank you so much. Come back soon and we'll go over even more that we plan and didn't get to. Everybody, you guys have a wonderful day. Make it the best day of your life. I'll see you in 23 and a half hours. Bye.